yes, you can you can do them. Uh, they're somewhat involved, but it is possible to do. So I won't try to do it in any exact form here. Uh, but you can, of course, take a look at different kinds of uh, regimes. You can try to um, uh, fix the rates and increase the uh, the block length, and then ask how does the error probably decay. Um, and then you, you end up with essentially refinements on this uh, e to the minus square root of n business with additional terms which depend on the how far away from capacity you are. Or you can ask the following question. You can say, I want to fix the error probability okay, uh, to some small value. And I increase the block length. Um, and then ask how quickly I can make the rate approach capacity. Okay. And then what is the gap between the the rate you can obtain to guarantee a certain error probability. And what is the difference between that rate and the capacity as, as the block length increases, how this one goes to, goes to zero. Now, it turns out that the polar codes and random codes, there's a, almost a square factor between them. So you essentially need to, uh, need to square the, uh, the block length to get to the same error probability as you would. This is maybe also somewhat apparent from this root n decay. But there's a difference between the polar codes and LDPC codes in that respect. So LDPC codes, they approach capacity a lot faster. Uh, or I shouldn't say capacity, but they approach the, for the places, for the rates up to day work, which may not be up to capacity for LDPC codes, they do it faster than the polar codes do. Okay. But of course, there'll come a point in which, if you compare LDPC code with a polar code, there'll come a point in which the polar codes will get a certain rate. LDPC codes cannot get that rate because LDPC codes get close to capacity, but not to capacity, mm -hmm. unless you do the spatial coupling, irregular stuff, and blah, blah, right. so forth. Um, if you ignore those kinds of caveats, then the polar codes do slightly worse, at least in this kind of um, um, pure vanilla uh, polar codes with no tricks of, of decoding, no list decoding, no, uh, no massaging. Um, would they also have something similar to like the irregular codes or the turbo head, like error floor kind of thing? They have no error floor. But they, one, have they have no error, they no have no error floor for, for, for polar codes. That's that's a nice thing about them. So if you're interested in uh, very low probability applications, then this could be a possible uh, way to go. Um, so unlike the error floor phenomenon, they they, they go down. So they, okay. Looks like we are past the thing, so I'll start. <clears throat> okay, maybe I should first start with um, any questions at this moment, because uh, I'll switch to something I promised in the morning, saying that we're going to deal with this uh, kappa of delta, which is somewhat boring and technical. So if you all want to leave, <laughs> I'll just do it by myself on the blackboard, uh, just to show that this, uh, the, the difference between the IW plus and IW minus cannot be too small if IW is away from the extremes, which is, in a sense, nothing to do with the topic that we finished now. So this might be a good place to ask questions about uh, what we have done uh, so far in these, uh, these couple of, uh, this last hour or two. Last hour? Sorry, I'm last hour, okay, I'm not two, okay. Okay, if not, I'll, uh, well, if you think of it, feel free to ask. I have no problem with interruptions, okay, uh, don't be shy. So what I promised was the following thing. We were trying to show this. Uh, morning. And this was important uh, uh, for both the proofs I gave you, both the proof which was based on the second moments and the proof based on martingales, that we had to know this, this morning's promise that if IW is moderate, then the IW plus minus IW minus cannot be too small for some uh, non-zero kappa, non-negative kappa. Okay, for uh, so there exists kappa of delta such that. Okay, uh, this is true. It's a function. And then uh, this kappa of delta furthermore when delta is positive. Okay. 
uh, thing to to prove. Okay, good. So uh, let's see actually what is going on with these uh, with these things. First of all, uh, this is exactly the same as I W minus I W minus. Right? So uh, since the I W plus I W I W minus are in a arithmetic progression, the difference between the, the ends of the progression is the same as twice the difference between the, uh, the, the, the difference in the progression at the middle, at the at the beginning or the end. Okay, All right, so we have that. So this is this is what I have to have to show, and uh, we call the picture of this W minus. So this. Um, W minus was a channel between u12, y1, y2, whereas W was a channel between uh, x to y, either x1 to y1 or uh, x2 to y2. It's the same thing. Okay? So I can put here either one or two as the index. It's the same. Okay, all right. And the and the u1, if you also recall, so we had this picture here. We had this connection diagram here. Remember that the u1, u2 were fair and independent coin flips. Consequently, x1 and x2 were also independent and fair coin flips. So in this particular case, what we have is the following thing. So x1, y1 is independent of of x2, y2. In fact, this pair and this pair had the same distribution. The x's have the distribution of being the fair coin, and the y's have the distribution of passing the corresponding x through the channel w. Okay. In fact, identically distributed to, indeed, um, I should write it here, indeed, x1, y1, and x2, y2, Are IID, okay, as pairs, okay. I'm not saying that the these two are dependent. I'm only saying that this, in, independent of this, and this has the same distribution as this. Okay, I'm not making any claims about independence between these. They're just false. Okay. Furthermore, uh, the probability that the x1 is equal to zero is half, same as the x1 is equal to one. So, each of these x's are fair uh, coin flips. And also the u1 is equal to x1 modulo sum uh, x2. Okay, right? That's the looking at the diagram from uh, you, know what, you know what I'm saying. So what you're supposed to take a look at is the following things. So this this uh, this i of w minus is simply i of the u1 and y1 y2. And we said the u1 was nothing but y1, y2. So there's the entropy of this x, which is 1, uh, of this u, which is 1, because u is a fair coin flip, minus the entropy of x1 plus x2 and uh, y1, y2. Okay. And the i of w. is the mutual information between, let's say, x1 and y1. It's also the same as the mutual information between x2 and y2. I'm just going to write one of them. Okay. This is also equal to 1 minus h of the x1 given y1, which is also equal to the 1 mi minus the entropy of um, x2 given y2. Okay. All right. So. Essentially, what we're trying to show is something like this. We want to make, we want to start a statement about the IOW being something, which is in this light saying that we, we know something about the value of this h of x1 given y1, and also the same thing about h of x2 given y2, but these are being uh, a certain value. Okay? And then we want to make a claim about the, 
the value of this. Similarly, essentially the same as I'm trying to make a claim about the value of that. Okay. All right. So what I will uh, claim is the following. Claim is that going to be this. Suppose x1, y1, and x2, y2. Are independent, okay. Okay. Further, suppose. Suppose further. That the. This entropy of h of x one given y one. Well, this is a number between zero and one, because. Uh, h of a x1, x1 being binary, will ensure that the h of x1 is between 0 and 1. Conditioning always reduces entropy, never increases it. Consequently, this number cannot be more than 1, nor can it be less than 0. It's a number between 0 and 1. So I can represent it as the binary entropy function of some value. Okay? Let me call this value to be, I don't know, um, I'm not sure what. Uh, let's say P1. I may regret this choice of P, uh, but uh, uh, let's keep it as it is at the moment. Okay? So this is essentially defining this P1 through the value of, the, of this. Okay? I'm essentially just giving this thing a more convenient name. I could have called this number itself to be H1, but I prefer to write this H1 as being the uh, this binary integral function of some uh, uh, value p. Okay. Suppose further that this is that, and h of x2 given y2 to be h2 of p2. Okay. Suppose these are these are given. Then the following happens. If you take a look at the h of x1 plus x2 conditioned on both. So then you ask, what is the entropy of the sum of these x's, conditional on both these y's? Okay. This is at least as big as h2 of um, what I'll write here is something. Let me define what this is. No, actually, let me write it. So this I'll abbreviate as being P1 star P2. Okay. Now, um, if you think of what is the meaning of this kind of strange expression, uh, P1 into 1 minus P2 plus uh, 1 minus P1 into P2, um, it's the following thing. Suppose I had a random variable, um, which was binary, uh, 0 or 1. And I took the value 1 with probability p1. Okay. I have another random variable, independently of it, also 0, 1 valued, takes the value 1 with probability p2. Okay. Suppose those were the random variables I had. Suppose I had a, let's say, random variable z And suppose these were independent of each other. And then I asked, what is the z, which is the summation of all these things? What is the chance that it's equal to 1? Okay. Well, the summation is equal to 1 only if this is 1, this is 0, or this is 0, this is 1. And those pose exactly this p1 uh, cross p2. Okay. So either z1 should be 1 or z2 should be 0, okay. this, or the other way around that the z2 should be 0 and z1 being 1. Okay. So this, this is sort of the convolution law uh, of these two distributions. Okay. So, this is, so this number here is not, some, uh, not too magic of a number. Okay. In particular, you would think the following thing. 
Suppose the y's were not there. This was simply I had two binary random variables. Oh, I see. Hold on a second. I have not said anything about the binary. Okay. Suppose uh, independent x i's are binary values. Okay. Otherwise, the statement I have <laughs> uh, cannot be proved as false. Okay. The, um, uh, so if you have simply two independent binary random variables, x1, x2, in the absence of y, okay, then this would be equality. Okay. You would have um, a z1, z2 would be our things. Okay. So this z1 has uh, entropy h of p1. This z2 has entropy h of p2. And their summation has entropy h of p1 cross p2. And in fact, only other possibility was to swap the ones and the zeros. But that doesn't change anything, because you're adding or complementing z1. Complementing z1 complements the sum of the z1 and z2. So it doesn't change entropies at all. Complementing z2 is the same way. So no matter how you made these probabilities, the ones and the zeros, differently, there's only two possible choices for z1 to have entropy p1, uh, entropy h of p1. It's either one or I could, uh, you know what I'm saying. So this will be equality in the absence of the y's. Okay? It's to show that the trick, the, the thing is to show that together with the y's, this becomes an inequality in this direction. Okay? All right. So now, if you take this claim to be true, now, this I have to prove. Okay, I'm sort of pushing my promise to you further and further uh, deeper. Okay? All right. If you take this claim to be true, then what you're going to show becomes uh, easy. Okay? Um, so this is saying the following thing. So if with the claim, with the claim, if IW happens to be equal to 1 minus H2 of P for a P which is um, neither close to 0 nor close to 1 and nor close to 1 half. Okay? So P is away from the things which make H2 to be close to 0 or 1. Okay? Actually, imagine P only being interval 0 to half. Okay? If P is uh, away from 0 and 1 half, okay? then um, what we have is that the um, this value is h of p. <coughs> Consequently, the value of this is at least h of p cross p, which says that the iw is less than or equal to 1 minus h2 of p cross p. Okay? And this thing says this iw minus is at most this, which says that the, the difference between IW and IW minus, I'm supposed to take this thing and subtract this from it. The ones cancel. I get H2 of P cross P minus H2 of P. Okay? We can try to plot this one okay, uh, against the IW in here. Okay. Yes, sir. Say again. Yeah. This is absolutely Mrs. Gerber's lemma. So, uh, okay. So, audience has, has knows more than what I thought. The so the statement which is this is here is exactly Mrs. Gerber's lemma. Um, so, those of you who have never heard of Mrs. Gerber or, or her lemma, um, the story actually comes from uh, Aaron Weiner and Jacob Ziv. Aaron Weiner, uh, I mentioned them already. I think yesterday. Uh, in the Shannon Day. Jacob Ziv is the same Ziv as the Lempel Ziv algorithms, uh, Jacob Ziv. Uh, Jacob used to visit Aaron uh, essentially every year at Bell Labs. So uh, Jacob Ziv was at Technion. Uh, he still is actually in, in Israel. He's, uh, uh, um, I hope he's doing well. I have to see him uh, soon. Uh, he used to come in the 70s and even to, uh, until the 90s, which I was, I was there. Jacob used to visit every year. And in the, uh, I guess it must be late 70s, the Aaron and Jacob were working on a problem called the, nowadays called the, the Weiner-Ziv problem. It's a question about uh, lossy uh, compression, lossy quantization, in the presence of side information at the receiver. Okay? So you want to compress uh, x without knowing a certain value y, 
but this value y is available at the reconstructor. So you know that t knows something, but not knowing what he knows. Okay? That is, so you know the statistics of the knowledge of this one. So, and this y is correlated with the x. Okay? So in working on this paper, um, there came a point in which they had to prove a statement such as this. At that time, though, uh, they were also trying to find a, a place for Jacob to stay. Okay? So they were calling um, uh, uh, around Bell Labs, there were all these uh, houses. Uh, and there were a number of these houses which were owned by uh, typically widowed women who would then take on, on the summers, quiet people uh, who would visit Bell Labs. These people, you know that they're not going to make a mess. They're going to clean after themselves and so on and so forth. So Bell Labs visitors were good, uh, good guests for, for people renting rooms in their houses. So they're trying to find a room for Jacob, and there was this Mrs. Gerber that they're trying to reach. And every time they would call Mrs. Gerber, uh, she would be not in the house. They would leave a message. Mrs. Gerber would call them back, but they were not in the office and so forth. There was a huge uh, the problem with uh, uh, trying to arrange uh, housing for Jacob because Mrs. Gerber was difficult to reach, and they were difficult to reach also vis-a-vis -vis the prospect of Mrs. Gerber. So they're in the office. This theorem is proved. The telephone rings. It is Mrs. Gerber. She says, OK, I have a room for Jacob. Hence, the dilemma is named Mrs. Gerber's dilemma on the, on the honor of uh, uh, Mrs. Gerber. So, uh, the story is from Aaron, uh, so uh, I had it firsthand. Um, uh, I hope I got it correctly. And I think that the, I'm not sure if in the paper of uh, uh, Aaron and Jacob, this in, is, is indeed called Mrs. Gerber's lemma. I think it is not, um, because I think the editor in chief of the transactions was Toby Berger, very, very nice gentleman. But he also had um, a sense of, okay, look, I mean, we should not be making jokes about this thing. Okay, whatever uh, you prove the theorems and lemmas should have proper names, okay, you're going to confuse people by, by calling this. So I think that the paper ma makes no mention of Mrs. Gerber, but I think somehow the story got out and so forth. Everybody we can refer to this thing as Mrs. Gerber's lemma. So sometimes I get students asking, okay, who is Mrs. Gerber? Okay, it's some famous information there is that is, that is hidden. No, that's not the case. That's, I guess we should again do this parametric plotting, no? because I'm supposed to plot on the uh, x axis 1 minus h of p. On the y-axis, I'm supposed to plot h of p cross p minus h of p. Okay. Uh, I stupidly forgot that the, I should have kept the definition of h of p. Um, so what have we said? p times log p plus 1 minus, uh, I cannot type correctly, plus 1 minus p log 1 minus p. I should divide this whole thing by log 2. And then uh, I'm supposed to set the, the parametric range to go from, let's say, 0 to a half. And I guess we had this points that the 0 was causing trouble. Uh, these are x and y axis ranges like this. And I'm supposed to plot 1 minus h of t. And on the y axis, I'm supposed to plot uh, t star t. If you compute 2 t star t, it is simply 2 times t times 1 minus t. Because I'm supposed to put p into 1 minus p plus 1 minus p into p. There are two of them. Uh, minus h of p. OK. Undefined variable p, of course. OK. T. OK, good. So we get the, we get the picture uh, as promised. Okay. It looks like I made this y range to be way more than necessary. It's like this. Okay. This, by the way, is not symmetric across the point 5. There's a slight uh, bump towards here. So even though um, this function here as a function of p would have been uh, symmetric across the 1 half point, uh, we're not plotting this thing against p. We're plotting against uh, the x-axis is 1 minus h of p. So it is being squashed by the, by the h. So we get uh, something like this. Okay. All right. So and the and our kappa uh, is going to be simply you pick a delta, you compute the height at delta, you compute the height at one minus delta, you take the small of these heights, and that is your kappa of delta. Okay. So so this now if you now believe um, this claim, uh, we are okay with the uh, with the kappa claim. Okay. So now I reduce the problem to proving uh, Mrs. Gerber's lemma. Okay. All right. If everyone knows the proof of Mrs. Gerber's lemma, 
we can go home okay, that they, so, uh, and then start tomorrow. But <laughs> I somehow suspect that some people must be hearing Mrs. Gerber's for the first time and so forth. That they, so, uh, OK. We will prove the <coughs> Mrs. Gerber's lemma by proving, reducing to something else again. Okay. And the, I'll make a further claim. Okay. Claim is the following. Now, the claim is this. If we plot on the x-axis um, h2 of t, I'll use this notation that the plotting program was giving me. Uh, if we plot x uh, h of t here, and the y-axis, I plot the h2 of for any A, let's say between zero and half, and I plot here h2 of at. Okay, so, and I make the t go from zero to one. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry, for any. Let me write this properly. A in the interval uh, zero to one half. In fact, I can make the 0 to 1 because um, uh, swapping a to 1 minus a uh, does not change the value of this thing here, okay? Because it only flips this one, makes the 1 minus the previous one. But since h2 is symmetric across 1 half, it doesn't change it. So whether I put here a between 0 and 1 or a between 0 and 1 half makes no difference whatsoever, okay? Um, if we plot this and then we plot it by tracing this t, you will obtain a curve like this. On the x-axis, as t goes from 0 to half, h of t will go from 0 to 1. Okay, this is the um, h of t. So you start at the, uh, at the left of the curve because h of t is increasing as, as t increases from uh, 0 to half. h of t goes from 0 to 1. So this is the x-axis here. And the y-axis, it starts with at t is equal to 0, you get h2 of a, because the star operation, it is a in times, so a times uh, 1 minus 0 plus 0 times something, so it is a. So you start with h2 of a, you start from here, okay? And then where will you end up? If the t becomes half, okay, uh, this becomes 1. So we be end up with here. And if t is half, the, va the argument is a times a half plus 1 minus a times a half. You sum up, you get a half. h over half is 1. Okay. So end up at this point here. Okay. So you will do something to go from here to here. Okay. So this is that t is equal to 0. You will start here. t is e equal to half end up there and then you'll trace the same curve back uh, to where it is as t goes from one half to, to one because if t is if you replace t by one minus t this doesn't change uh, because h2 is symmetric this will flip the this argument to one minus its argument h2 doesn't change so it's like this so I might as well plot this thing also up to t is equal to a half there's no point going from one half to one it'll take you back again to where you started from if we plot this, so now I haven't made any claim yet for any blah blah. If we plot this, the curve that we plot is convex. Okay. Then then the plot is convex. So this thing has an increasing slope. Okay. All right. Now. Um, at this point, it's not obvious how this will prove the Mrs. Gerber's lemma, okay? But we'll need this. Uh, let me at least prove this one, okay? And then uh, we'll prove the Mrs. Gerber's lemma on the basis of this one. So now, all I have to show you is that the, the slope in this curve that we have drawn is an increasing slope. Uh, maybe I should say not the plot is coming, but the curve is coming. I guess I heard a question of this type. Is that the, okay. 
So the curve that we plot is a, is a convex curve. OK. So I need to prove to you that the, uh, as I walk along this curve, I have an increasing slope. So well, how do I walk along this curve? I might as well just walk along by increasing t. Because as t increases from 0 to 1, uh, the x-axis increasing from, uh, as, as t goes from 0 to half, the x is increasing from 0 to 1. So walking along this curve is the same as increasing t. If I have a particular t point here, how would I compute the slope? I'll say, well, I mean, if I move the t a little bit, my x has changed a little bit. My y has also changed a little bit. The ratio of these changes is my slope at this point t. Okay, all right. So what I have to do is the following thing. So the slope at the point at the, at the point corresponding to t is the del by del t or y of t. This is the uh, this is y of t. Okay. Divided by the del by del t of x of t. Okay. What am I supposed to show is that the this guy derivative, the, the derivative of this guy here is increasing. This is increasing in t. So what we have to show is that the when I differentiate this ugly object once more with respect to t, I will get an increasing, I'll get a positive uh, quantity. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the variables on the axis is this is h of t, the h2 of t. Okay. And this is uh, this value, this value here. This is h2 of of a cross t. Okay. So the y is uh, h2 of a cross t. a is a fixed value. It's not changing. Okay. And uh, t is changing from uh, 0 to half. As you change this t, you will sweep this curve. Would you want me to plot this thing on the computer? I could, but I think it won't really. You'll, get this, you'll, get, you'll see this plot. Okay. We already drew it without the computer. Trust me that if you can try it yourself, you'll see this plot uh, on the computer if you did this. Okay. OK, so now um, we should differentiate this uh, ugly thing. Okay. So first of all, it uh, looks like differentiating this is easier because it contains fewer <laughs> things in it. Um, and it's, once we do this, it'll be easier this one because this is a affine function of the t. It's just almost linear. Okay, this, is, this thing is um, 1 minus a times t plus a t. This is 1 minus 2a times t plus, uh, what am I doing here? Not correct. a times 1 minus t. This is 1 minus 2a times t plus a. So this argument is uh, nice and, let's say, let me say linear, even though it has an additive factor there in t. So once we know how to differentiate h, we can do the chain rule to differentiate the next. Okay. Okay. So, the derivative of h of t, and secondly, in fact, let me use here all natural logs as opposed to the log twos. Uh, it only this will simply shrink the figures, but not change any kind of convexity property. Okay. Um, so this one will become log two. Okay. Everything is done in the natural log base. I don't want to deal with di di differentiating log base 2 and so forth. I never remember if I'm supposed to multiply or divide by log e. So I'll keep it like this. This is, uh, you can easily compute to be ln of 1 minus t over t. It's just an exercise in, uh, in algebra. We have different t log t, derivative of t is 1 times log t, and then the derivative of the, of the uh, t times the derivative of log, which is 1 over t, that's 1. But those ones cancel with the come things on the other side, and so forth. You get this. Okay. All right. This is the derivative of the, of the h. Um, that is the denominator here. Okay. And consequently, del by del t h of a star t is going to be the following. From the chain rule, we pick up this 1 minus 2a in the front. And we have the same function, t replaced by a cross t, okay. L 
and uh, end there. All right, good. So this ratio now we know is the ratio of this uh, to that. Okay. And since we assume that the I can assume that the a was between zero and half. This is just a positive constant. Okay, so for the purposes of testing the increasing this or not, I can ignore it. Had it been negative, I have to worry, but it is positive, so we're okay. So now we have to check the following thing. So now we have to check, uh, we have to differentiate this guy, the ratio now I have here, and then one minus a star t divided by a star t, and then, and then we differentiate this and then ask, is this guy uh, non-negative? That's our question to do. You need to check. Is this true or not? Okay. That's the thing we need to verify to claim to, to show that the slope is increasing. Consequently, that this function is, is convex, is equal to checking, is this derivative uh, uh, positive or no? Okay. All right. so, so we compute this, uh, this derivative. Okay. You have to watch me carefully, because I'll make a mistake for sure. Can I sort of catch? And then uh, you will save all of us lots of backtracking and then, oh, I made a sign mistake here and so forth, okay, uh, it would be irritating. Um, can I erase? Okay. So, since we're only checking the sign, the rule for the differentiation of these ratios is derivative of this guy multiplied by that, derivative of this guy multiplied by this, divided by the square of this. But division by the square does not change the sign. So I ignore the denominator completely. I want to call the numerator of the, uh, of the, what do you call these things? Rules for derivative of, of ratios, okay? So the, okay. we differentiate this guy here, all right? So the differential at the top, so it's a, it's a log, is a bad difference of logs, okay? So the, I need to differentiate del by del t ln of, 1 minus a star t minus the ln of, of a star t. Okay. Well, this is uh, not too complicated. This is the derivative of the, of the top part. So differentiating ln will give me 1 over 1 minus a star t. But I have to remember the chain rule. Okay. This 1 minus a star t, so this was a star t, it has minus 1 minus 2a in front of the t. Just like that, okay. and then I differentiate this guy, so it is minus a star t. But then we also said that this guy I need to worry about the uh, chain rule again. So, but this has a star t, which has one minus two a. In there, so this I, if I collect the terms, there's one minus two a in common. Okay. Two a. Uh, so minus signs I took care of. Then I have a summation of 1 over 1 minus at plus 1 over at itself. If you equalize numerators, etc., the numerator becomes 1. Okay. So this is 1 over a star t and 1 minus a star t. Okay. So we got the we got the top. And I guess we then will get the denominator for free because uh, the denominator is the same as the numerator for the special case of a is equal to zero. Okay? So consequently, the derivative of the denominator t over t must be minus one over t times one minus t. Okay? All right. Now to put them together for the for the chain rule. So the derivative of this ratio. Um, I don't need them anymore, I think, right? I can erase. So the derivative of the slope at t is given by, uh, so the derivative of the top, which was, uh, okay, uh, minus one minus two a, 
uh, divided by uh, a star t, 1 minus a star t. This is a derivative of the numerator, which we just computed here, times the denominator. minus the derivative of the numerator, which is this. So this becomes a, the minus sign becomes a plus, times the uh, numerator itself, which was ln 1 minus a star t, a star t. Um, within the, I forgot the division by the square term. Okay, This is. Uh, modulo positive constants that we forget about, it's the same thing. So the sign of this is the same as the sign of that. Okay? All right. Maybe I should say the following thing. This being positive is equivalent to this guy being positive. Okay? Or the same as saying that this, this term is bigger than this term here. Okay? Okay. This is uh, what we need to, need to show. Okay, but this is the same as the following thing. Um, this quantity here is uh, non-negative. Okay, so is this quantity here. Okay, let me then put them uh, like this. So what I need to show is the following thing. Uh, the question is: is t times um, 1 minus t times ln 1 minus t. So I put these guys in here, those guys I'm going to put there. Is this thing less than a star t, 1 minus a star t, ln a star t? So this is what I'm supposed to, to check. Is this true uh, for t, for a being between 0 and half, and t, anything we want? OK. So now, let us look at this thing as a, as a function of a. Okay. So on the left-hand side, okay, it's like I'm a boxing announcer, okay, on the blue corner, we have a nice linear function of a. Okay. All right. On the right-hand side, for a fixed t, I have some more bizarre function of a. Okay. All right. So this bizarre function of a is in the following type. I evaluate the function, um, so it's like this. If I define f of x being x times 1 minus x times ln of 1 minus x over x, if this is my function f of x, this thing here is evaluation of f of x at a star t. Okay. All right. So this is a star t for this definition of, uh, of f. Okay. All right. So this function here. Now let's take a look at the two extremes. At a is equal to 0 and a is equal to half. Okay. At a is equal to 0, okay. This is 1. I have here t 1 minus t ln 1 minus t over t. And if a is equal to 0, a star t is t. So this thing is exactly equal to the right to the left-hand side. So at t is equal to 0, this inequality holds. At, t, at a is equal to a half, what did I say? At a is equal to 0, this inequality holds. At a is equal to half, this is 0. OK, all right. And a is equal to a half, what do we, what do we have? This is a half. A uh, half star anything is a half. This is a half, okay. But this is also a half, and this is equal to a half. So the argument of the log is one, okay. So this is also zero. So okay. So at the two ends, for a is equal to zero and a half, I get uh, equality, and this is this is linear, okay. So in particular, if this function were concave, concave it will lie above its chord. So this thing is, the, is a linear function which matches, the func matches this. So I have this, uh, what we have is, um, this is a is equal to 0, 
a is equal to a half. Okay. On the uh, this is the left hand side. It's a linear function, and I'm hoping that the this uh, this f of the uh, a, t, a times a star t as a goes from zero to half lies above it. If this f of a star t happened to be concave, I would be done. Okay. So let's check if it is or not. If we are lucky, it will be concave. If it is not, I mean, a function might remain above the core without being concave, okay, because it's a particular core that we are drawing. I'm not drawing all possible cores. So uh, then we have to work even harder to show that this is the case. But we are hoping that the, this f is already concave, and then we'll be fine. And now the function that we have to check the con concavity is the function which maps a into f of a star t. Okay. But as a star t, as we said, is, a, is an affine thing. So the concavity of this guy in A is the same as the concavity of this guy in X, because shifting something by uh, changing the X by a constant, or scaling the X by a constant, or even flipping things around, okay, does not change whether the thing looks like this or not. Okay? If we have a function that looks like this, if I squeeze it, it does look like that. If I shift it, it still looks like this. If I flip it around, it still looks like that. So all um, f of an affine thing is concave, if and only if f is already concave to begin with. Okay. So I should only check the concavity of this function uh, in f. All right. Good. Uh, so that's a strange thing. I mean, this, this is a stupid uh, thing that I'm, we are wasting half an hour on. Whereas we could prove the convergence of these uh, complicated processes to zeros and ones and fast. It took us only an hour. Uh, and then we are uh, working on this, uh, uh, checking that some function is concave for a while. So how do we check concavity? I differentiate twice and check if it is negative. Okay. All right. So now we have to differentiate f of x once and then once again. Okay. All right. How do you differentiate this? Well, we have to derivative of this times the others, derivative of this one times the remaining stuff, derivative of this one times all the other <coughs> remaining stuff. Okay. So um, unfortunately, I'm at the wrong end of the blackboard, so I see nothing. Okay. So somebody will have to check for me if I'm doing things all right. The first one derivative is 1, and remaining stuff is 1 minus x ln 1 minus x over x. And the second one's derivative is minus 1. So I have here minus x and then 1 minus x uh, over x. Okay. And then I need to keep the other ones and differentiate the, the other guy. Okay. And then I have here derivative of ln uh, 1 minus x over x. I think we had just did this before and found it to be minus 1 over x times 1 minus x. This is then. This was the derivative of the ln 1 minus x over x. I multiplied by x times 1 minus x. Okay. So this becomes minus 1. It's a constant. Okay. So if I differentiate once more, so this disappears because it's a constant minus 1. You need to worry only about uh, these things here. Uh, I think we had done the differentiation of ln 1 minus x over x, and we had found it to be, to be this thing as this derivative when we were differentiating this uh, ln 1 minus t over t with respect to t. I think we had done that and then found it to be, to be like this. Am I mistaken? Uh, I might be, so let's, let's do it. Okay. Yeah, so we had differentiate. So okay, let's, let's do this. So this is just the difference of the two lns. Okay. Um, so the ln 1 minus x, its derivative is minus 1 over 1 minus x. And minus, uh, minus ln x, its derivative is minus 1 over x. So this is, if I sum them, minus 1 over x times 1 minus x, okay. which is uh, exactly the thing here. Okay. Multiply by the others. OK. Uh, so this, in fact, I can combine these two things together. Ah, this is nice. So these two things is 1 minus 2x times, times this. 
So this is the same as the derivative of 1 minus 2x and then 1 minus x over x. So now we know again how to do this. The derivative of the, of the first, which is minus 2, okay? And then uh, my, this thing times the derivative of the other, okay? And again, we know what the derivative of this thing is, okay? We keep computing for some reason this guy. Okay, good. But now, fortunately for us, uh, in which range does the x live? Remember, this x was um, uh, this a star t. Okay, x was a star t, and both a and t were in the interval zero to a half. So the x that we worry about is in the interval zero to a half. In that interval, um, if x is between zero to a half, one minus x is more than x. So this ln is an argu uh, argument of the ln is, is more than 1. So this quantity here is bigger than 0. Okay. All right. And the 1 minus 2x is also uh, bigger or equal to 0 when x is between 0 and 1 half, because those are the x's that we, that we have. Okay. Um, so what we have is then, together with the minus signs, I have some minus sign here, some minus sign there. The denominator here is, is positive, so no problem here. So this thing is less than or equal to zero. So this f is uh, is concave uh, as required. So consequently, uh, we have shown that this slope, the derivative of the slope, is indeed bigger than or equal to zero. So this function is indeed a convex function as claimed. Okay. So this curve is convex. Okay. So so I seem to have managed to waste uh, I don't know almost a whole hour in. Uh, in this, in this business. Um, but now that we have this, uh, can I prove that the Mrs. Gerber is from this one? Okay, this is a difficult part, so the rest is going to be uh, easy. So now what we have shown is the following thing. So the claim is equivalent. This claim is equivalent to saying the following thing. Equivalent to this. So. So if you solve for t from x, okay, so um, h2 inverse of x, of course, I mean, since h2 is a function like this, <coughs> if I give you a particular value x, there, there can be two values of t which satisfy the, this one take the one which is less than a half. Okay. So uh, by this h2 inverse, it is the inverse of the h2 when the h2's domain is restricted to the interval 0, 1 half. Okay. So this is the value of the t. Okay. And we think with the, with the a, and we took the h2 again. So we simply say that the, the mapping, the function which maps x into h2 of a star h2 inverse of x, is uh, is convex. This is what has been uh, shown. Okay. All right. Good. So now let us see how to go from here to the Mrs. Gerber's. Okay. okay. So what was Mrs. Gerber's uh, saying? Gerber's, we are trying to prove that the, when we have uh, h of xi given yi is equal to little h2 of pi, I want to claim that the h of the sum of the x1, x2 condition on y1, y2 is at least as big as h2 of uh, p1 cross uh, p1 star p2. This is what I was trying to, to show. Let's uh, write these things and then to see uh, what, this, what is the meaning of this quantity and so forth. Okay. So what we know 
So we are given the following things. We have the um, probability of that the y1 is equal to little y1, so all y1. This is the h2 of, let's say, probability that the uh, x1 is equal to 0, even y1 is equal to y1. Here I'm computing exactly h of the x1 given y1, nothing else. Okay? So we are given, we are told that this is equal to h2 of p1. Or in fact, let me make it to be. So we are given, so we are given this for i is equal to 1 and 2. We know this particular thing. What I, want to, what I want to know is to say something about the, the value of this. We want to estimate So this is the conditioning of the y1, y2. Okay. And what do we have here? We have the H2. Okay. So condition on the fact that the y1 is equal to y1 and y2 is equal to y2. The, um, the distribution of the, um, of the sum is exactly convolution of this one, star of that one, and the other one. Okay. Let me y2. This is the exactly the h of the uh, x1 plus x2 given y1, y2 is this. Okay. All right. So now, the idea is the following. We're going to write this thing as being h2 of h2 inverse of, of itself. Okay. The, maybe h2 inverse of h2. Okay. So this will say This this object is is like that. Okay. Okay. Um, so now, what I have here is an H two of something crossed with. I'm going to call this one to be A at the moment. I'm going to fix the Y two. I'm going to take a look at the Y one summation first. Okay. All right. Now what I have is the following. Now what we have is for for a fixed y2, take a look at the summation over y2 first and y1 inverse, and take a look at the inverse summation over y1. I have a probability that the y1 is y1. I have h2 a. This a is the is uh, this quantity here. So this a is nothing but the H2 inverse of H2 of um, okay. sorry this is uh, it, it is this one here did I copy incorrectly maybe yeah. sorry but I but it's good to get this thing uh, correct but the, what is written in the last line uh, uh, sorry about this this is the uh, sorry <laughs> which line this line here or this line there uh, this line first part so there's a probability of y1 is equal to y1 before this, oh, I see. We want to lower bound. It says we want to lower bound uh, this summation. So this summation is exactly equal to this quantity here. So this summation is the 
meaning of this h of x1, x1 plus x2 condition on y1, y2. So I go over all possible values of the y1, y2. I take a look at probabilities. And then I say, ah, if the y1 is equal to y1 and y2 is equal to y2, then x1 has the following distribution, x2 the following distribution. They're both binary. So their sum is a binary random variable with certain probability of being, uh, being 1. So this quantity here is the entropy of the sum conditioned on specific values of the y1 and y2. So if I average them out, I get the entropy of the x1 plus x2 given y1, y2. OK. All right, good. So now this summation here, which is occurring as the inner summation over there, uh, now shows you the convexity. Okay. So, so the, the function uh, h2 of a cross h2 inverse of something is convex in the something. Okay. All right. So consequently, this is bigger. The average of a convex function is bigger than the convex function at the average. Okay. So expectation of x squared is bigger than expectation of x quantity squared. That's the square being the generic convex function. So this is bigger than the h2 of a star h2 inverse of now the average summation over y1 p of the y1 given y2 y1 h2 of x1 equals 0 given y1. Okay. But this is exactly, this is nothing but, did I include enough parentheses? Okay. This summation is exactly the h of x1 given y1, which we'd assume to be equal to h2 of p1. Okay. h2 inverse of h2 of p1 is exactly p1. So this whole thing is equal to, to p1. Okay. So this is equal to h2 of a star p1. Okay. So now do the trick exactly once more. Okay, so now what we have is the, the complete sum here. Is I'm somehow, I'm, I, I took care of so this, tr this summation over the y1 already. So what I'm left is the following thing. Uh, so consequently, if you now do the summation over the y2 of the p of the, uh, of the y2 is equal to little y2, uh, h2 of, recall they replace the a with what it was supposed to be. Actually, let me do it the other way around. Again, do this trick of writing this probability as the h2 inverse of h2 of, of itself. Okay, so I'll stick in here. this. Uh, again, use the convexity of the same function to push this averaging in inside the thing there. Okay, so this is bigger than h2 of p1 cross h2 inverse of, of, the, of this whole thing. Uh, this whole thing is simply uh, h of x2 given y2, which by assumption is h2 of p2. h2 inverse of that is p2 itself. as claimed, okay? okay? I rushed this a little bit, it seems, but uh, essentially we use the same trick twice, okay? On, on, the, on the summation, we, we first write this thing as a y2 and y1, freeze the y2, take a look at the y1 summation, which we did uh, nicely here. Now replace lower bound, this whole thing, with the lower bound over the inside, do the same trick once more for the, for the y2 business. And then we get uh, the thing as claimed. So, so this proves the, the Mrs. Gerber's lemma. Uh, so we are done. Okay? So we prove this strange. Uh, uh, so this, this thing was, was claimed by taking a whole bunch of derivatives and checking convexity of concavity of something or the other. Using this, we prove the Mrs. Gerber's lemma. Mrs. Gerber's lemma guarantees that we have this uh, funny curve which lower bounds the uh, uh, 
uh, IW plus minus IW minus in terms of IW. So we get our kappa. So I think uh, my promises in the morning are now uh, are now fulfilled. Okay. So anybody is in doubt, uh, ask me. Okay. But uh, but in principle, we have the material. Okay. All right. Uh, this one is this is x one. I apologize, but sorry. Uh, tell me once more. We have one more parenthesis. Sorry. Uh, sorry, it's hard to look at the blackboard from the from the close and then see what I'm writing. The other quite from the outside. Uh, you're unhappy with the um, with the second line. There's a parenthesis missing. Okay, hold on. Dink, 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 donk. Okay, so the, so the, uh, you might be right. Let me put one more just, to, <laughs> just in case. Okay. I feel like I'm writing list programs or something. Because that's the Probably that y two is equal to y two. Yes. That's a capital Y. Uh, this capital Y is equal to little y2. Okay, uh, so uh, P1 cross H2 H2 minus blah blah. Okay. Okay. And I hope I have enough parentheses to 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 close. Okay. 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 Um, so. Um, I ran over time again. I'm sorry. Uh, so. Tomorrow is a shorter day, fortunately, for all of us. So I guess uh, we said 9.30 in the morning, right. and then uh, two hours in the morning, and then, uh, and then over. What I want to talk to you about tomorrow is, um, is the following. Maybe let me just say a few words. So we now saw that polarization happens. It happens sufficiently fast. It happens fast enough to arrest uh, error propagation. Now, the, the difficulty that remains is the following thing. Um, we said that you give me the channels. You give me a rate which is less than the mutual information of this channel, and I said that I can find a uh, correct number of R times N uh, sub -ch synthetic channels which are good. Now, the problem is uh, how do I find them? Because we know that they exist. Okay? We know that the W with the all pluses is a good channel. W with the all minuses is a bad channel, but uh, how am I going to, to choose the, the other ones uh, because I need to choose a lot? And if you want to do this thing by brute force computation, it is easy for the BEC, because we could do it on my, on my laptop even uh, yesterday or day before. Or yesterday, OK, yesterday. But uh, if you want to do this thing for a general channel, since the synthetic channels end up being uh, more and more complicated channels, because the output alphabet size keeps getting squared every time uh, you do one more polarization step, fairly soon you will run into a computational problem that you cannot even store the representation of the channels on your computer because uh, the output of it becomes enormous in size very quickly. So you, uh, uh, out of memory error, okay, uh, comes after three, four steps, uh, you're, you're in trouble. Okay? Uh, and maybe even three, four steps. Okay? Um, now, uh, we had to figure out how to get around this problem. Okay? Uh, fortunately for us, there is a way. Okay? So uh, nothing is, not everything is lost. Okay? Uh, I'll try to show you what this way is. Uh, it's not a difficult way, so I think uh, two more two hours would be more than sufficient to do so. And perhaps we can even have some time for um, drinking more tea or uh, asking questions, etc. Okay, it's uh, all right. So thank you very much for staying so late, and I apologize for running over time uh, again. <laughs>